Everybody and welcome to Real Supernatural Encounters. Today, for my guest, I have Andrea, and she is going to tell us about her encounter. But before she does, will you give a brief bio about yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, I. My name is Andrea, and for the sake of privacy, that's the only part of my name that I'm going to disclose to everybody. Um, I live on the Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, I'm 36 years old, and I am basically um, fully disabled and stay at home most of the time. I have a lot of activities that I'm involved in, um, even though that I, even though I'm disabled. Um, but mostly, I just stay at home and take care of my animals and and do be like a housewife. So that's basically what I do. Um, I don't really know what much else to say about myself except for that. I'm a very happy person. I try to have a positive um, outlook on every situation, whether it be negative or positive. I try to see the good in things. And um, because I've been through a lot in my life. And so um, I've learned over time that I just really need to try and find the good in things and not let negative energy bring me down. And to that subject, I am a sensitive, um, which means that I can feel the feelings of other people. Um, I don't know the exact explanation, but for example, whenever I'm around somebody, I can get their, um, their feelings. I know how they, I, I know, it's kind of like I know how they are without them even saying anything to me. And I also am able to connect telepathically with people. Um, and most people that that happens to, they don't realize that that's even happening. It's just something that I'm able to do. And a lot of that comes from my encounters over the years and the way that I communicated through those encounters with entities and or um, what I call humanoids or uh, how would I really say it? Humanoids, um, hybrids. Basically, um, if I were to give a description of what that is, I would say that it's part entity, part human. And I've had a lot of interactions with those type of entities. And um, it's all been telepathic. There's no, there's no vocal, vocal part of that. Everything, every communication with any of those entities have all been telepathic. So that's something that I've been able to bring to my waking life and use in my everyday when I meet people and even it's so weird I have like this connection with animals too so like I'm able to connect telepathically with animals as well but yeah so that's basically um a little bit about me and I think I think I'm done with that but um, I'm ready to move on to the encounter all right well <laughs> I guess story. since you're if you're ready go ahead and you can tell you okay story. okay so Bear with me, you guys, because I might get caught up a couple times on, on the story. It, to me, seems like a long one, and there's a lot of details involved, but I'm going to be um, as accurate as possible and as candid as possible when I tell you guys what happened. Um, this was the summer of 1994. I was a 10-year-old girl in the fourth grade. Um, I lived, like I said, on the Gulf Coast of Florida, still do to this day. Um, and I lived with my father at this time and not to get into a whole bunch of detail about my life as a child, but I came from a very, very abusive 
beginning. Um, my mother was an alcoholic and, um, you know, my whole life, my whole early life. And at the age of nine, she came and dropped me off to my father um, and basically said, here you go. Uh, you've had no experience with your daughter her whole life up until now, but it's time for you to become a father and take care of her. So basically that's what happened. My dad um, at the time was in a relationship and had a, another small daughter, but there was, you know, marital problems because of what my mom did and how she brought me and just dropped me off with him. Um, so he ended up leaving the woman that he was with and moving out and taking me and we moved into an apartment separately, just me, just myself and my father. And um, not not that my stepmom or, or his other daughter, um, because there was turmoil, like I said, because of what my own mother had done by just leaving me there and leaving me in his responsibility and care. So at this time I was enrolled in school and, um, you know, I was having not a very normal childhood. I would say, um, I had, I was going through a lot of abuse with my dad. Um, I attribute it now as an adult to the fact that my dad probably did not know um, how to be a father or how to be a father of a girl, um, which is, you know, I won't make excuses for the things that happened to me, but I understand why some of the things happened to me that did. Um, but the point I'm trying to make with telling you guys that is, so what ended up happening, my dad had a sister, an older sister, and her name was Kathy. And um, she was like a mother to me. My aunt Kathy was my world. She still is my world to this day, um, which I'll get to in later parts of the story. But I wanted, you know, or in the sequel of this, I wanted to tell you guys, I don't want to spoil about the news about my aunt Kathy right now, but just know that she was a very important person in my life. Um, she taught me values. She educated me, you know, she just was a very good person in my life. And to that subject, she used to, um, notice when she came over to visit the abuse between my father and myself and how, you know, how he was not able to hear, care for me as he should be. And my aunt um, was an ER doctor at this time at a major trauma hospital. And um, she, you know, she had, she had education and she knew when she was seeing abuse and she started to devise a plan to get me out of that situation. And it wasn't one that was so blunt as to tell my dad, listen, you're abusing your daughter and, you know, she shouldn't be with you and we need to take you, take her out of, you know, I need to get her, get her away from you. She just did it in a really smart way. She would start by um, coming and picking me up and we'd have outings. You know, she would take me um, to eat dinner at a really nice restaurant. And then afterwards, you know, we'd catch a movie or something together and just make great memories. And I felt for the first time in my life, this is somebody who really loves me, you know, and, you know, really wants to dedicate time to helping me, you know, or being there for me. And it was a, just an amazing feeling. And so she would do that. And that happened for, let's say maybe a month, two months. And then it would graduate into, I would go and spend the nights at her house, you know, and come back the next day. Um, whenever she would get time off because she had a very, very busy schedule as a doctor. And so eventually after, you know, several months of that, she finally took me to live with her. She finally got permission from my dad. Um, I think she told him a story like she's a girl. She needs a motherly figure. Um, she needs somebody who can, you know, explain to her about, you know, the female things in life that you're not going to be able to explain to her. So just let me take her on, you know, and educate her and, and take her for a while. And it'll, you know, maybe you can go and fix your marriage. Maybe you can go back and try and fix your marriage and I'll take responsibility for her. And so that's what happened. From that point on, I lived fully with my aunt. Um, I was enrolled in school. I had a schedule. I had um, things that 
were required of me by her. She was very, very strict, um, but loving. Um, I always knew, which I'll get to later. I always knew that when I was in trouble, I always knew when she was serious and when, you know, things that she said, you better pay attention to. Um, we are, to that point also, we are um, half Italian and half Cherokee Indian. So if you can imagine a crazier mixture, I don't know. I mean, but we, the Italian part of my aunt was the strict one. You know, I remember being cussed at in Italian and as a, a small kid, and I'm like, you know, not even knowing what she was saying, but yeah, <laughs> you paid attention regardless. So anyways, I lived with her full time. Life was great. You know, it was a lot better than it was with my dad. And um, we would do all kinds of fun things. And one weekend or leading up to one weekend, my aunt had mentioned that she wanted to take me on my very first camping trip. I was ecstatic. I didn't know what camping was. I'd never heard of camping. Um, but it was explained to me that we were going to go out into the woods and do all these fun activities. Um, like we're, I was going to go fishing for the first time, which was so cool. Um, I was going to look for artifacts, which were like, you know, arrowheads and blown glass or pottery that may have been left by the Indians. And, um, you know, just, I was going to be able to drive a car. Like she was going to teach me to drive. So there was like, some really cool aspects to that camping trip that I was anticipating. So um, for about two or three days leading up to us actually going on the camping trip, I was nagging her every single day when she would get home from work. I would, are we leaving yet? Is it time to go? Um, what do we need? What should I bring? You know, just all, all the questions that I had as a little girl about an exciting camping trip that was upcoming. So it was a Friday when we finally left for our camping trip. But on that Friday, I remember us packing. At the time, she had a, um, I'm going to try and remember what this car is. <laughs> what this car is. It's one of the ones that was really famous, like back in the day for rolling over a lot. It's It was an SUV, but I'm not sure what. Maybe, I want to say maybe like a Kia Sportage or some kind of Jeep family SUV. I'm not sure. But it was definitely like one of those tomboy type cars for a woman to have, I guess. I don't know. But anyways, I remember us loading it up with every single thing that we could possibly need for this camping trip. We had a tent. We had like chairs to sit in, a camping stove, a cooler. Um, we didn't have, I mean... Blow up beds weren't a thing in 1994. So we had sleeping bags, which was cool, and pillows, and you know, just all the comforts that, as much comfort as we could have camping. Um, so, anyways, we had all those things and we set it, we set out for our trip to go camping. And it was about a four hour drive from where we lived. Um, to be specific, it was within Whistlacoochee State Forest, which is I want to say central Florida and um, so about four hours from where we were. Um, so we set out and before we, we got on the road and um, before we got too far, we stopped and we had Taco Bell. And I remember that because it was like a very memorable um, experience at the Taco Bell. I growing up, anytime I got to eat out was a complete treat to me um, because I was deprived a lot as a child of food and so anytime I ever got to eat out it was so special and it, it was like something that I really enjoyed and loved doing and Taco Bell was my most favorite restaurant as a kid and so I remember getting like the Nacho Bell Grande and my aunt got the at the time they had this I don't know if they still have it to this day because I'm not a fan of Taco Bell today, believe it or not. I do not. <laughs> but um, at the time they had like a taco pizza and she got that. And I remember there was something, she didn't like some of the ingredients on it or there's something wrong with it. And she made me go back in and return it and get her a different one. And then, so that happened and we ate and we enjoyed our dinner and we took off again on the road. I remember the road being like a very long two-way road like so 
we were going one direction. I mean, this is like an like an old country road, like an old highway. Um, so we were going one direction and coming past us was a lot of semis and, you know, other vehicles. And it was just this two, two lane road and everybody was so close together. And, you know, there was big trucks passing us every couple minutes. And because my aunt, she was a very cautious driver. And so it seemed like a trip that, you know, was going to take us the four hours that it needed to take us really took us probably like six, but getting closer to the actual area where we were going to go camping. Um, there was one town, I want to say maybe an hour outside of the area where we were going to go camping. And, um, there was a Walmart. So we stopped at the Walmart and we loaded up on everything that we needed for the cooler, like food, uh, drinks, uh, everything that was needed to sustain us for three days of camping. So we got, um, oh, also we got s'mores, which I was super excited about because who doesn't like s'mores? Um, I never had heard of them up until that point, but my aunt explained to me what they were. And I, was very excited to try them for the first time. So we did that. And um, after the Walmart stop, we made our way back onto that road and continued on. And um, I remember in that area of where the, of where the state forest is, there is a very small rural town there with like maybe one mom and pop restaurant and a gas station and just, you know, very basic, not, not, not anything really um, like a big city or, or town would have. But um, I didn't see that until later on anyways. I just, um, I just knew that the, the area that we were in was very rural and very surrounded by trees. It was the forest. We were basically going into the middle of the forest. But um, all of a sudden on that main road, my aunt turned off and went down this like dirt road trail and I was just kind of like, I don't know, you know, what's going on here? You know, is this, are, are we lost? Is this the road we're supposed to be on? But my aunt knew exactly where she was going. Um, she grew up going to this campground as a young girl and had been there many, many, many times. And um, so she knew there was no doubt of where she was going or getting lost or anything like that. So you have to remember also back in 1994, GPS wasn't a thing. So anytime that we needed um, to find out where we were at, she would pull out a map and, and look at the map, but she did not need to do that for this trip. She knew where we were. So I remember traveling like, let's say maybe six or seven miles um, in down that dirt road and deep into the woods um, before we came upon I wouldn't really say a gate because there was no gate there. It was just kind of like if you see two big um, wood poles on either side and then you can see that you can drive right through it. Um, what would they call that? I don't know. It's got like a wood thing on the top and two poles on the bottom, but it's where you could drive through. Yeah. And there may have been a gate there in the past. I don't know. <laughs> I do know, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> so, but at this time there was not, and there was definitely not anything indicating where we were or the name of the campsite we were at or anything like that. Um, but like I said, my aunt knew where we were. So I was confident in, you know, just being a kid and going along with it. So we got um, in, we drove past that and for about two or three more miles kept going. And finally we arrived at the campsite and the campsite, if I could explain it to you guys so you could have a visual of what it looked like, was um, kind of like if you're looking at a baseball field without any of the familiar markings of home base or one, two, three, whatever. It was just a plain like octagon or diamond shaped area that had separate um, areas where people would do their bonfire mm -hmm. and set up camp. They had this they had like one little wood post that had a, a hose and a water spigot on it where you could get water out of to put out your fires or whatever else you may need it for. And so um, I wanted to tell you at this point, there was nobody else at this campsite. 
for it to be a weekend, you know, in the past, they're usually, like my aunt said, there would usually be other campers and people camping there. And it was very popular, even though it was deep inside of the woods. Um, so she thought it odd that nobody was there. And, um, but it was okay. It was okay because it meant that we got to pick the spot that we wanted. And she was very happy about that. And she found out, she found a spot, um, one of the more secluded spots in the back that was, had the tree line right behind it and a little trail. And so it was a really nice spot. And I remember us parking and she said, we're going to set up the tent. And that was the first thing we did. I had never had any experience with setting up a tent. But um, like I said, for my aunt, everything was educational. And so she taught me for the very first time what it meant to, how, how to set up a tent, what you had to do. And we did it. We set up the tent. And so then after that, the next um, steps or the next things that were imperative that we do, because it was already so late in the afternoon, was to, sorry, there's a fly that just flew in the car, <laughs> was to um, go ahead and start our campfire. Uh, and we had already eaten dinner, but we wanted to make the s'mores. So my aunt instructed me to go down the path um, that was behind the tent to gather as much firewood as I possibly could. And she told me what firewood was and what it looked like. And so I knew what I was going to go do. Um, but before I, I did that, she put a whistle around my neck. Like the, I don't know, you remember the old coach whistles? Yeah. So one of those around my neck and she said if you have any problems or if anything happens blow the whistle three times or blow the whistle loud and I'll come to you right away and I'll help you and so you know I, I was I was cool with it I wasn't scared to go do that by myself because I knew that my aunt was a very brave woman and I knew that you know what we say now today is she was packing like she had protection so we were good so I did that and I came back with as much firewood as I could carry in my hands as a 10 year old and put it all down. And she started the fire, the campfire. And um, it was decided at that point that we were going to need more wood to sustain us through the night. So um, at this point she goes and she says, okay, we're going to go get, you know, more wood so we can make sure that we have enough wood to stay warm throughout the night because even though it was the summer when you're deep in the woods and it's you know a summer night the temperature drops excuse me it's the temperature drops and it gets chilly mm -hmm. and so she wanted to make sure we had enough wood to keep and other animals away or you know whatever whatever we would have needed for the camp to the wood to have the campfire so that's what we did so we came back after we got the other wood and we sat down around that um, we pulled out our folding chairs and sat down around the campfire and we started the process of making our s'mores and just the rest of the night was filled with entertainment of us you know my aunt would tell me her childhood stories of camping there and you know the adventure she went on and the things that she did and her favorite sp fishing spot and you know just entertainment of that sort like just us having, you know, open, open conversation with each other, uh, me feeling like the, there was somebody that I could actually talk to that would listen to me and, you know, realize that I was a person and I was there. It was amazing um, that the whole night was filled with conversation and songs and, you know, just singing a lot. And then it got pretty late and, you know, bugs were becoming more abundant, like mosquitoes. So we were like, okay, we need, you know, my aunt said, we need to go inside the tent and retire for the night. And that's what we, we did. I remember crawling into my sleeping bag, but before I did any of that, she made me go to the bathroom for the last time. She had set up about six feet away from the tent, a camping shower and in the camping shower, and it wasn't an actual like camping shower that we were going to take a shower and get cleaned off in. Um, it was just more for like a privacy, little privacy tent, um, camping shower thing. <coughs> Excuse me, my asthma. Um, so she set that up and inside of that, I'm not going to try and be very graphic here, but inside of that was, if you can imagine the five gallon buckets and then, you know, a little comfortable seat to do your business on, that's what was inside of there. And so, um, I was instructed before I got in the tent to go to the bathroom. Um, and I did that. And then I came back and I got in the tent. I remember getting in my sleeping bag 
she was in her sleeping bag or on top of it, something like that. And we just continued on um, with our conversation and singing songs. And I remember that there was one specific song that she was trying so bad to get me to learn. And she's, you know, I, I would say, she would tell me the lyrics of it and she would say, no, it has to come from in here. You have to sing it from in here, not, not just your throat. It has to come from down below. And I couldn't grasp the concept of that. I, I just wanted to sing it from my throat and sound like, ah, and it was horrible. <laughs> but, um, and I also remember getting very bored with the song really quick, but I remember to this day, exactly the name of the song and it was uh find the cost of freedom by Crosby Stills and Nash and just the lyrics of the song you know um how they resonated with me and how they still do to this day as a as a memory of my aunt um but anyways that 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 song was sung I got bored with it I begged her to move on to a different song that was more current for you know 1994 I don't even know what was what what songs were popular when I was 10 but it was definitely something other than like a 60s or 70s song <laughs> so that happened we were singing and um I remember um feeling very sleepy and wanting to get wanting to go to sleep and you know prob probably my aunt too um so I think I'm not sure I don't remember if I said that I fell asleep first or if um she fell asleep first on this particular on the first night I think that it was me that fell asleep first um but I'm not sure I don't really remember um but anyways we were both asleep we both went to sleep and I want to say around two two o'clock or two thirty in the morning maybe before three I don't I don't know it had to have been early morning hours though because we went to sleep around I want to say nine or 10 o'clock. But, um, when I woke up again, it was, um, very, very early in the morning. I'm stuck because I'm trying to, my brain is trying to remember exactly what time it was, but I know that that's not like, and it's not probably logical for me to try and remember the exact time. But anyways, I ended up waking up to noises. I heard noises around the tent. Um, I heard like clicking, like, and that was odd. And then I heard like um, something walking around behind the tent and breaking branches. And so at this point, this had been going on for, I want to say about 10 to 15 minutes of me just laying there listening to this stuff. And I was getting increasingly more terrified of what I was hearing all around, like the sound of animals, like the noises that, you know, animals make in the deep woods and stuff like that. And it was, it was scaring me. And so I ended up waking up my aunt and telling her that I was hearing somebody or something outside of the tent or around the tent. And being the person my aunt was, she uh, immediately told me to stay still and not get out of the tent. And she opened the tent door, um, of course, with her protection in hand and walked outside of the tent and was looking around. I don't know how far out of the tent she went, like how many feet or steps or anything like that. Because like I said, I was instructed to sit still and not move. And that's exactly what I did until I heard my aunt's pistol go off. And when she disfired her weapon, I immediately jumped up because it frightened me so bad and ran straight out of the tent to find out what had gone on or what, you know, find out if she was okay. And so um, when I did this, she immediately instructed me to get back in the tent and started pushing me. She came towards me and started pushing me back into the tent. And she explained to me that she heard some branches breaking and noises too. And she disfired her weapon. So as a, like a warning shot so anything that may have been around us would have dispersed and just left us alone and she explained to me that she thought that it was probably animals coming into camp because they smelled what we were cooking or something you know and to me that was that was a legitimate 
um, reasoning for the noises and good enough for me to fall back to sleep and not, you know, really care about anything. <laughs> Just go back yeah. to sleep and have an uneventful, uneventful rest of the night. And so um, I remember, I remember at some point, probably around, I'm not sure if it was, if it was Saturday night or no, it was Friday night. So this was Friday night. So I woke up the next morning, Saturday, um, without any further issues. There was nothing, you know, anything to really speak of and when I woke up, we got up and did our hygiene and, you know, we were, had a lot of events planned for that day, things that we wanted to do. And so I remember that this was now Saturday and um, we were going to set out early because, and we didn't have to, you know, do anything with the tent because we were staying another night anyways. And so it was great. We could just get in the car and go. And that's what we did. Um, the first thing that we, we, the first activity that we decided to do was fishing which was so incredibly cool I've never in my life fished and I learned how to put the worm on the hook and you know just get all gross get like get my get my fingernails full of like wormy worm stuff which was so gross but so cool and um we fished I cast that she showed me how to cast off um my pole and I sat on this big limestone, like natural limestone, um, for lack of other words, I'm going to say pier, but I don't know, ledge maybe, and just sat there and fished. And I could have literally stayed there all day long and just fished because it was the coolest thing I'd ever done in my life. And the, the river was flowing and it was just really beautiful and cool. And, um, but no, we couldn't stay there all day and fish. So my aunt was like, we need to move on to our next activity. and. We did. Um, I think the next thing that we were supposed to do was, um, I think we were going to, I want to say that we were going to um, look for artifacts or metal detect. I don't know what it exactly we were going to go do, but we went to do that. And I remember getting hungry, um, like wanting to eat because it was breakfast time and, you know, so my aunt was like, you know, I'm going to drive you into town to the mom and pop restaurant that is, um, that's there. And she had been to it many times. And so we went and we ate and the pancakes were amazing. They were the best pancakes I've probably ever had. <laughs> so, um, that was, that was, that was a nice experience. And then afterwards, um, we went to a first date uh not first aid we went to a gas station a little like gas station that was right there and got boiled peanuts and you know some first aid stuff because um I had on my right leg I had um something I had like some kind of gash or something on my right leg that had dry blood on it I don't know how I did it um and I didn't we hadn't noticed it until then, but my aunt was like, you know, you need, we need to clean it out so it doesn't get infected. And, you know, and she wanted, um, she wanted just some first aid stuff. So she got that and, you know, some bug spray for the mosquitoes and whatnot. So we left and, um, got back to doing our activities of the day. And so on Saturday, there was this cave that my aunt wanted us to go see. Um, it was called Blowing Hole Cave. And I don't know the history behind it or how it got that name. But as a child, my aunt was able to go inside of it and explore it and um, to a certain point. And then, you know, you can't go any further, I guess. And she wanted me to have that, that same experience. So she took me, give me just one second. Okay, <laughs> fine. Thank you. So she wanted me to um, have that experience. So she took me over there and we got to, I mean, we were walking and walking deep in the woods. Like we parked the car somewhere and then we walked inside of the woods to this, this cave and we got to it. We knew we were there because there was a little marking that said what the name of the cave was. And then there was a, another 
sign, like a more formal sign that said that the cave had been closed off and that nobody, no entrance was permitted into the cave, which was a complete bummer because we really, really wanted to go into the cave, but it didn't happen. So we just ended up exploring the rest of, you know, around that area, metal detecting, which was something, another activity I'd never done before. And I remember, you know, it getting probably around four or five o'clock, maybe by four or five o'clock in the afternoon at this point. And my aunt was like, we need to head back to camp before it starts getting too dark and, you know, do dinner and, you know, get our hygiene done and just, you know, relax for the rest of the night. And that's what we were going to go do. So I remember getting back to camp and I was instructed again to go get more firewood and my aunt started the fire with the first wood that I brought. Then again, we went and got wood together and she started dinner. Um, my job in that was to just roll up the, <laughs> we were having hot dogs and roasted potatoes. And I, my job was to roll up the potatoes and tin foil and like put salt and pepper on them. It was going to be like a really, um, <laughs> a really basic campfire dinner. Like there was not going to be any sour cream or butter or anything that you do with baked potatoes. Um, there was no buns for the hot dogs. It was just going to be very basic and enjoyable. <laughs> and it was. And so I remember that happened. And then it, it was getting dark and the bugs were becoming more abundant again. And so we got inside the tent again to go to bed on Saturday night. <clears throat> and um, that went off without a hitch. We were asleep within no time. And um, I mean, we had talked to each other a little bit and cuddled and you know, whatever. And then we were asleep. And so around five o'clock, not even five o'clock, that's a lie, maybe probably around four o'clock. Now, these are just estimates of time in my brain. Like I don't, I can't accurately say, hey, it was two o'clock in the morning because I don't have any concept of time during this. Really, I don't. Um, I just imagine based on seeing, you know, outside and what I felt the time may have been. So around, let's say four, three or four o'clock in the morning, more probably more towards three, I woke up again. And this time I wasn't hearing any noises or anything. I just really, really needed to go to the bathroom. And so I uh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um so I remember getting up and then, you know, getting out of the sleeping bag as quietly as I could and tiptoeing to the tent door. Um, that, oh, I didn't mention, I forgot to mention it. It's probably irrelevant. But before I went to sleep that night, my aunt had taken off the roof of the tent and we were like stargazing and stuff like that. But before we went to sleep, she put it back on. Um, but that's just a detail I forgot. But anyways, I was trying to unzip this tent door that had like now that I think of it it was like a bank full it had like three different sections that you had to go through to get out of the actual door and so here I am you know a 10 year old trying to do this as quietly as possible and not wake up my aunt because <laughs> you ain't supposed to be up at this time young lady what are you doing you know but anyways I had to go to the bathroom so anyways what happened she woke up and she's what are you doing and I'm like oh I have to go to the bathroom excuse me and she's like okay take your flashlight with you I was like okay you know and I was gonna take my flashlight and I'm still at this point still rustling with this tent door that has three different sectors to it that I can't get out of and in this she's just back to sleep like she's just gone <laughs> back to sleep snoring and everything and I'm like okay that's cool like I'm okay to do this now I can go potty and there's not going to be any problems <laughs> you know i the reason I say that was because I was always so precocious as a child not to do anything disrespectful because I knew what punishment was <laughs> and I wasn't trying to get punished. So anyways, I finally um, got the tent open enough and she was, like I said, back to sleep. And I got out of the tent and started walking to my perception of where the, the uh, makeshift bathroom was that she had made. And honestly, this is where it starts to get very strange because I don't remember ever going to the bathroom. 
I knew that I had to go to the bathroom, but I never remember actually going inside of the bathroom and using it. I remember my only memory that I have for the rest of this whole night was being not being stopped physically, but being stopped in my tracks by lights that I saw um, mm -hmm. over like the trees. So if we're right here, then oh, across, like across the field and in the trees, yeah. I saw like, I want to say like at least, I don't know, maybe six, maybe, maybe four black helicopters, but that's what I thought they were, black helicopters, um, just hovering above those trees and the lights that were emanating from them. And I remember just seeing those and thinking, you know, what are helicopters doing out here at this time in the morning? But I have to be honest, and I'm going to be so honest and completely candid with you guys. I really do not remember anything past that point at all. Okay. So in the morning, maybe five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning now, I am, I wake up again and I sit up and my aunt is up already. She's inside the tent and she's been up for a little while and um, she's sitting there reading a book um, that she brought with her and this stern look comes across her face and I knew that look. I knew that that was a look that you're in trouble, that you did something you weren't supposed to do. And she had my full attention. And so her next words were, Andrea, do you remember what you did last night? And I kind of like was very quiet and cautious with my next words because there was no way that I was going to say something that um, would have got me slapped in the face because that's exactly what would have happened as if, if I would have said something, you know, that was, you know, something she would have combated with, you know, I know damn well you did something, you know? So anyways, so she says to me, look over there in front of the front, like where the tent, you know, it was a pretty big tent. And she's telling me to look at the, at the tent door. And she wanted me to look at the ground in front of the tent door. And she says, you see all that dirt and mud in front of the tent door how the hell did you get all of that inside of this tent just by going six feet to the fucking bathroom excuse my language basically yeah. exactly what she said to the bathroom and um so at this point i was not even going to begin to deny anything she was accusing me of doing um because i knew that there was going to be a uh, uh, there was going to be a a reaction to me denying anything she also said you know why would you even think about leaving the tent door open after you came back in after using the bathroom and i had no like i said to you guys earlier i had no concept of anything that happened after i saw those helicopters and those lights i don't even know what happened but anyways to make my aunt content i just you know profusively apologized because I was like, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I will never do that again. I will, you know, be more careful. Um, and I just remember as a 10 year old child, you know, it scared me so bad that I was crying because I knew in my mind that I didn't remember, even as a 10 year old child, I knew in my mind that I did not remember going to the bathroom at all or even coming back at all. And so because I didn't remember these things and now I'm being accused of doing other things, it was, it was terrifying for me. And so I was crying and I was telling her, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. And, you know, apparently it was enough to make her, you know, to get back in her good graces because I was at that point told, you know, just do your hygiene, get ready for the day. And that's what I did. And, you know, we were going to go out and do our other things that we, other activities that we had planned for Sunday or wait, this is Saturday or Sunday now? I don't know. Was it Saturday night? Yeah, it was Saturday night. It was Saturday. It was Saturday day that, that, that this happened, that I was told to do my hygiene and, you know, whatever. I think my days are so mixed up. I'm so sorry if I'm not exactly, exactly accurate in the days, but I'm trying to recall it to the best that I can. But anyways, I was told to get up and do my hygiene and get ready and that's what I did. 
Okay, so I remember saying earlier in the story that the first activities that we did were on a Saturday, but in in actuality, they were probably on um, they th those activities actually probably happened on on Sunday, and the activities I'm going to explain right now happen on Saturday. If that makes any sense, I'm sorry, it's so confused. So, but anyways, we did that, and because we were staying another night, which would have been until Sunday, um, we didn't have, to, like I said earlier, we didn't have to move our tent or anything like that. We just, you know, got in the car and went and did our activities. Today, um, we were supposed to go to an Indian burial ground because at this time, um, there was a lot of Indians in, in history that had passed through those grounds, and my aunt was a was an avid um, explorer she loved anything that had to do with exploring and so when i had mentioned that we were looking for artifacts like um arrowheads and stuff like that that's probably the activity that we actually did on saturday and so um and then we made our way to this cemetery that was in the woods somewhere and um but prior to even getting to that cemetery i had my first lesson on driving my aunt um and I knew it wasn't, I, for me as a 10 year old, it was like, this is going to be so fun. And this is, you know, a fun activity we're going to do. And, you know, what kid doesn't want to try and drive? And so that was my, my outlook on it. But for my aunt, it was not that way at all. My aunt was, this is in case of an emergency, this is something you need, a skill that you're going to need in case you need to go get us help. And so that was the purpose of being taught that. So I remember pulling her pulling off of the side of the road and saying those exact words to me and um, saying, you know, I'm going to let you do an illegal activity right now, but it's not because uh, it's not for leisure. It's just something I you need to learn, a skill that you need to have while we're out here in the woods in case you need to go get us help. And so I didn't see it like that. I saw it as a, <laughs> I'm getting, I'm going to try. <laughs> and so so she um, pulled over the car and got in the passenger seat. Um, but before she did that, she put some pillows underneath me because I couldn't quite make over the steering wheel yet and um, or reach the pedals very well. But she adjusted the, the seat to where I could reach everything. And when she was confident that I could see over the steering wheel and also reach the gas and brake pedals, um, she was like, okay, cool. And got in the passenger side, but she buckled my seatbelt she got over there and she was like, um, okay, instructed me on how, what you're supposed to do to drive the car. So of course there were a couple mess ups, like me almost hitting things, but <laughs> I got the hang of it, you know, fairly quickly. I got the hang of it and was doing pretty good. I was staying, you know, steady on, on the path and wasn't very off. I knew how to brake and how to do the gas. And, you know, I was only allowed to go a certain speed, which was, you know, okay, because I didn't know anything about speed. I was 10. So, so I was cool with going 10 miles per hour. It was cool. So anyway, she was helped me pull off the road. I pulled off the road um, and she got out and got behind the vehicle. And um, she told, she instructed me to continue driving on. Um, so I did. And it was like, maybe I want to say what, maybe a mile or two more that I maybe less because she was walking behind the vehicle. So it was probably a definitely less. Um, and I was continued to drive on and she was evaluating my skill of driving basically to see if I was able to stay on the path and, and do it. And so once she was satisfied with the fact that I, I knew how to drive, well, in case of emergency, um, she's then said, you know, put the car in park. And then I, she wanted me to get out and get back in the passenger side. And she took the wheel again and got back in the car. And we went further up down the path to about two or three miles, basically, where we would have to park the car and get out and hike into the woods again to get to the location we were going to. And like I said, you know, you're inside of the middle of the forest. So any, I don't know if normal were, normal is really a thing, but any normal person would get lost. <laughs> We get lost immediately. Like you would have no sense of direction because everything looks exactly the same. And so, but not her. Like I said, she was like on a mission. Like she knew where she was going, how she was going to get there, what the trails were to take. And it was just amazing to see somebody with so much experience and know how to do things. And a woman at that, because my aunt, she was like Superman. Like I could not believe all the things that she knew. 
And so it was cool to see her, her do that. And so we got out after she parked the car, my aunt grabbed the backpack. She filled it with first aid stuff. Um, I think there was some water and maybe some snacks and I don't know what else, just a survival backpack to say the least. <laughs> and so um, we locked up the car and we headed off into the, into the woods. There was a trail um, and we headed down that trail and um, it was a good four miles of walking at least. And um, down that trail, on the way down that trail, my aunt was like, make sure you keep your eyes open for artifacts, like in, you know, like arrowheads and pottery and stuff like that. She's like, because back in like the 1500s, or I don't even know if this is right, but somebody I'm sure is going to Google this, like these specific places that I'm talking about and find out the actual dates, which is cool. Feel free to um, correct me if I'm wrong in any of the things that I'm saying, because, you know, I don't know the actual facts about the place. I just remember the name and, you know, some things, some details, but anyways, so around 1500s to let's say the 1800s, the Seminole Indians tracked through these same woods a lot. And so they were, you know, they had their, their houses, their teepees there and, you know, a lot of burial grounds, you know, for their people. And just, it was just a really um, memorable site because it was where they lived basically. And so I remember tracking through about four miles, we get to this cemetery. And the way that I knew that it was a cemetery is because I don't know if, I know at least I'm from, like I said, from Florida, but I've been to Georgia and I don't know if anybody knows about Southern Georgia, how some of the cemeteries have like white picket fences and stuff like that. The really old ones. Um, but this one did, it had like a white fence around it. And it had a plaque that designated it as an Indian burial ground and, you know, Seminole Indian burial, burial ground specifically. And it had a little small entrance where you could go inside the actual, where the graves were and, and, you know, walk around, look around, whatever. And, um, you know, a lot of people had brought, um, a lot of people previous to us had brought flowers and artifacts and stuff like, like, you know, not artifacts, but figurines, you know, out of respect and left them there. And so um, I, I, I guess I thought it was cool as a 10 year old, but I just couldn't figure out why we were standing in a graveyard. Like mm -hmm. who does this? I don't know. <laughs> Apparently I do now because like that's one of my most favorite adult activities is going to graveyards. <laughs> um, but my aunt had um, this thing that she used to do where she would rub gravestones. She would put a piece of um, paper up against the actual stone and take charcoal and rub the gravestone. And so it would leave an imprint on the front of, you know, of whatever, of whatever the gravestone said. And so that was one of the activities that she was doing. And then she, um, but before she did that, she did like this weird, she burned this um, incense and um, said, you know, like a prayer, because like I said, we pay respect to any, you know, any Indians, any, I want to say any other um, Native Americans yeah. and, you know, their nations and everything like that. We pay our, res we pay our respect to them because we are part Cherokee. So, um, that's what she was doing. She was paying her respect before we were allowed to go in there and, and explore basically, um, basically asking for permission from the spirits there to, for us to be able to go in and explore and, you know, just explore the area. So she did that which was weird as a 10 year old watching that. And then um, she did her gravestone thing, which was, okay, that's another weird thing she's doing. But then she was like, I wanna teach you how to meditate. I didn't know what meditating was. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't know what meditating is, but okay, you know, I was, I was so eager to learn from her as a kid. Like everything she taught me, you know, most kids don't pay attention. I know the kids of today could care less you know, about anything, but as a, you know, in the early nineties and as, you know, a kid that went through so much abuse where I was like, not paid attention to when I had my aunt's 
full attention and she was trying to teach me something, I was eager to learn it. And so it was really awesome. So I was like, okay, she's like, find a spot and sit down. And I did. And then she taught me how to meditate, which was so freaking awesome. Like I remember as a 10 year old kid thinking that was so cool. And then coming out of that and, um, being more like I felt more calm and I felt like I was more aware of my surroundings and in touch with my surroundings um on a deeper level like not like on a on a mental level (laughs) right so it was really cool and um that was it we did that and it was done (laughs) and then we I think you know we did some other things walked and explored some more and then you know got out of there and um there's only so many things you can do in one day in the forest before the light starts getting going down and you got to get back to camp and, and whatnot. So I think, you know, that's what we did. And, um, it was later in the day at this point because we had done, you know, other activities, other things that she had thought of for us to do. And, um, we had to go back to camp because it was getting, well, not back to camp. We had to get back to the car because we were deep in the forest and we couldn't, you know, um, risk being stuck inside of the forest yeah. and not getting back to the car <laughs> uh, before dark and so we had to get back to the car and that's what we did we went we made our way back to the car when we got to the car um we drove back to our campsite and at this point um i was you know being told to clean up again needed to clean up and do our routine that we were doing you know every night is get the wood and make the dinner and do this and do that and that's what we were doing and um I remember us, we had probably just had had dinner and, you know, we're right about to go into the tent for the night and not come out again till, till next morning. And when, uh, when, um, a park ranger pulled up, it, I want us to probably eight o'clock at night, a park ranger pulled up and, um, apparently they were alerted to us being there by our smoke our fire smoke mm-hmm. that was coming up and so he was he was doing a round and 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 I guess they were doing rounds every other night at that particular campsite um mm-hmm. because there was some stuff going on which I'll get into so um he it turns out my aunt knew him um because they had went to school together and so it was somebody she knew they weren't like friends but they were acquaintances and she knew who he was mm-hmm. and but he was not there on like a, a a basis of checking up on us he was more trying to um get us out of there like we weren't supposed to be there and he was trying to make us leave and um he went on to explain that to my aunt and of course i was you know eavesdropping on that conversation because that's what kids do And he went on to explain to my aunt that um, they had some suspicious activity there uh, within the last couple days that, you know, the last couple weeks probably of um, there being like these burns on the grounds. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was not, he said that it didn't coincide with people's actual campfires um, because everybody had a designated camp bonfire place. Like there was like a, a circle pit where they were supposed to have their fires inside of that pit. And if they had fires anywhere else, that was completely illegal and that couldn't happen, but it was. So he was, well, I mean, I don't know if it was actual fires or what it was, but he said that uh, he was telling her that there was like these incidents of on the trails, there being burns and, you know, like things that should not, you know, should not be happening. And also within that time they had found some gutted um like gang animal like deers and stuff like that um and that was also highly illegal you're not allowed to kill kill protected state um state animals like that and so that was happening and so because of those things that were going on um they closed down this campsite they um he went on to mention to my aunt that I guess, I guess I want to say three days ago from the time we were there, there was an actual gate that was up at that entrance. And on that gate, there were um, signages saying that this particular campsite was closed off to the public um, and that, you know, entering would be 
considered against the law and against against ordinance, park ordinance, et cetera. And so, you know, we shouldn't be in there. Um, but he had also mentioned that when he pulled up, he also did not see the gate that was usually right there that's supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, he didn't see any of the signage that they had posted. And so he said he went off and explored to try and find, you know, where are these signs that we posted? Because they're pretty big signs. And where are they? You know, and he said about 15 feet away in the woods, he found the sign that was, you know, directing the people to stay out upside down and um obviously picked it up put it in the back of I guess his his truck or whatever and he had told my aunt that um at this point my aunt was like you know listening to this and she said well it's early really late at night and you know I don't want to risk driving out of here you know I just you know basically begging him to let us stay just until the morning the early morning and we would be on our way we'd get up and just you know be out of there because we didn't want to really drive. She didn't want to drive. We, I say we, because now I'm a driver at 10 years old, but she, <laughs> she didn't want to really drive out of there that late. And so, um, I think at that point he agreed to letting us stay one more night and with, with, with telling my aunt that you need to be out of here very early in the morning because we have work crews coming to fix the gate and repost the signs. And, um, my aunt was in agreement, and I think at that point he got out of his truck and he it was like he was inspecting our campsite like he wanted to make sure that we were you know doing everything that was legal that we were supposed to be doing like he wanted to look inside of our tent um he to make sure I, I guess maybe he thought we were sewing away animals or something inside of it. I don't know but he wanted to do that and he wanted to look in the cooler and I think he was doing that and make sure that we didn't have like any illegal fish or something I don't know and um after he was content with the fact that we were following the guidelines and doing what we were supposed to do well while camping there he um made it clear to my aunt one more time i'm gonna allow you to stay overnight just because i don't you know i, I agree with you that you probably shouldn't drive all the way out of the woods this late at night you know um so he let us stay overnight and he was content and took off and so at that point um we retired for the night we went into the tents and we're we went to bed and um it was a it was a peaceful night nothing else happened that night um <laughs> nothing else happened that night but um and so we woke up in the morning and when we woke up in the morning sunday early morning when i woke up sunday early morning my aunt was going off like going crazy and I'm like, oh God, not again. <laughs> My first thought was, what did I do this time? Like I knew I just had done the worst thing this time, something very wrong. And she was like, get up, get across, uh, put this together, put that together, get everything ready. And freaking out. I'm like, what's going on? You know, and she's like, uh, we're she says it's eleven o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, what? You know, she's like, um, yeah, we were supposed to be out of here by five o'clock this morning and you know the work people were going to come and put up a new uh new gate and and new signage and i promised the ranger we were going to be out of here by five o'clock in the morning and so we got everything loaded and we got into the car and we started driving and my aunt did like this break thing like you know where you have a thought and you like stop like dead and she's like oh shh you know what I'm trying to say and she was like um what if they already put up the gate and we can't get out and we're stuck in here and I you know at this point I'm just along for the ride like I just don't know don't have a comment because I know it's best to keep my mouth closed when she's in these type of modes and so I'm just along for the ride and we luckily we got to the gate that wasn't there there wasn't a gate there was no evidence of anybody being there. Um, it was daylight outside when we got up somehow. I don't know. Um, but we got to the gate. There was no gate, uh, no signage, nothing. And my aunt was like, what the she's like, didn't he say that they were going to be here early in the morning to put the gates up? And, you know, so she, we didn't think anything else of it. The goal was to get the hell out of there because we didn't want to, you know, get in trouble for still being there. So we did. We got the hell out of there. 
so um <laughs> we drove and drove and drove and finally we made our way home and um I want to say that you know life went pretty much back to normal at this point like mm -hmm. everything was routine again my aunt was going back to work and um me back to school things were just normal again the way they I guess as normal as they could be with the exception of I started having terrible nightmares um for every night of the nights that we were since we got back home which was Sunday afternoon um starting I want to say Sunday night and for about a week I was having bad nightmares um I was having like you know, it, it was ongoing for several weeks, actually, but it was most memorable for the first week um, because I was being like having paralyzed, being paralyzed, sleep paralysis during this. And so I didn't open my mouth and mention anything about it at that point um, because I, I actually also got very, very sick. I um, was so sick that I couldn't breathe very good. Um, and I ended up having to go to the same hospital that my aunt was a doctor at. And I was diagnosed with asthma. I was diagnosed first with a severe um, upper rep respiratory infection. And then um, after that, severe asthma. And both of those things I had never had before. I was never an asthmatic. I never had issues with breathing, any of that. And so that was a new thing for me. I was put on like medications, inhalers and stuff like that after that and breathing treatments and was supposed to be taking those things. But, and, and it started to get better. I did get better. I wasn't hospitalized or anything like that, you know, because I had a doctor that I lived with. I didn't need to be hospitalized. So my, you know, my aunt could basically take care of me from home and, you know, give me the treatments and stuff that I needed. And things started to get better as far as my health was concerned, but the dreams weren't going away. I continued to have terrifying dreams every single night and I can't describe the dreams but except for maybe one or two just me walking down you know me walking down a dark road at night um just you know darkness all around me uh me being felt like I me me feeling like I was being pushed somewhere or pulled somewhere or you know just very terrifying dreams to the point where it was like so terrifying that I actually did tell my aunt about it one day after she got home from work and I remember like going into the detail at the time with her about the dreams I was having and she then um said to me and I was so surprised because she then said to me um I've been having the same dreams basically and about the sleep paralysis her too that she had had that happen too and that not to basically not to worry too much about it to try and stay calm and that she knew somebody that could help us with it and like a therapist or something that could help us with it and that we would be okay um I, now as i'm telling i'm recanting this um story i'm remembering that i forgot a whole um section of the story Mm -hmm. that I needed to I'm going to insert right here so after we left the park and we got out of there on Sunday I forgot to say that we also um needed gas so we stopped at the first gas station um that was there in the little town and we were going to try and fill up on gas but they were closed and my aunt was like you know 11 it's 11 o'clock why are they closed that was so weird okay so but they were closed um so we had enough gas to push on to the next gas station which we did and we got to the next gas station i remember having to go to the bathroom which you guys are probably thinking at this point damn this girl pees a lot but yeah i had to go again <laughs> and so my aunt said you know go ahead and go to the bathroom and make it quick and but before i went to the bathroom i had heard as we were entering the gas station the clerk said to my aunt the young lady that was there said to my aunt something something along the lines of good morning ladies um the coffee i just put a new co a pot of coffee on the uh burner or something like that and um and that was it and my aunt i remember hearing my aunt say to her do you mean don't you mean good afternoon ma'am it's like you know almost afternoon it's 11 a.m and then seeing the clerk like get this like like dumbfounded look on her face and like say 
yes ma'am like in the country accent because now you know i'm from florida and i'm hearing in my mind's eye this country accent that she had sam but yes ma'am but uh it's only 6 a.m <laughs> you know like something like that and my aunt was gonna go off on her like i saw that look that i get when i'm in trouble she was giving that look to this lady basically and she was gonna go off on her but before she did that she like lifted up her hand like this and was um started looking at her watch and noticed that her watch said 11 a.m still the time had not changed it was stuck on 11 a.m and there was a crack on the watch like a crack on the glass of the watch and she just thought that that was like the strangest thing but she I remember telling me tell, her saying to me because she saw that I was still standing there hurry your ass up and let's <laughs> let's go so we did we got the gas and we were out of there um, she um, got into the car and looked at the digital watch that was on digital watch, digital thing on uh, dashboard on the car and confirmed it was like 635 in the morning still. So in her mind, she was thinking what the actual is going on, you know, and she's looking at her watch and doing this number right here, because, you know, what is what, what do you do when your watch isn't working? You, <laughs> you hit it and try and get it to work again. And um, so, no, that wasn't happening. But anyways, this watch, I just want to mention this watch was, you know, she had it for about 12 years at this point. And this watch was um, very sentimental to her because it was a gift that she was given when she graduated medical college. And it was a very expensive watch. And so she even used this watch um, in her hospital setting as a doctor. You know, she would call time of death with this watch. She would, you know, this watch was very important to her and it was on her every single day. And for the 12 years that she had it, up until this camping trip, it never malfunctioned once. And it didn't even have a, a scratch on it. So it's just really, really odd that that happened. But anyways, I wanted to come back and, and, and mention that because I thought that that was some imperative detail that I left out. But anyways, back to the dreams and the par the par paralyzed state of mind. So my aunt was like, <clears throat> okay, I know somebody that, you know, can possibly, that can help us with this. And I don't want you to be worried about it. Just go on about your life, you know, your every day. And I don't want you to spend extra thought on it or anything like that. And it's not, you know, it's dreams. It's not something that can physically hurt you. <laughs> Bull. <laughs> I say that now. I say that now because I realized that those words were a lie. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I accept as a 10 year old, I accepted her explanation of it for what it was and, you know, did what she said. So over the next couple of days or over the course of the next couple of days, I heard her um, speaking with somebody on the phone and I would catch up. I would catch, you know, just you know, the butt end of the conversation, I guess, between her and somebody else. I had no clue who she was talking to, but she ended up setting up some therapy sessions with one of a, a colleague of hers, which is also like a friend or something. But this person, and this is the first time I had ever heard about this, this particular topic or what it was. Can you excuse me for one second? Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to just turn the camera for one moment, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry about that. I have a sinus infection right now, um, so I apologize. <laughs> okay, so um, anyways, um, she had set up some therapy sessions with this colleague of hers, and this colleague specialized in hypnotic regression therapy. And for, I guess, your audience or whoever, you know, may not know what that is i'm gonna do my best to explain it but i don't i'm i don't know if i'm gonna really get it i'll just base it on what actually happened to me and what you know what the details of it are but to 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 be fair in the explanation i would say that it's like you go to a therapist and you are made to somehow remember um suppressed memories yeah. that you would not remember in your everyday waking life if that makes any sense so it's going to be like basically all stuff that's stored away in another part of your brain that you, unless you, now I have access to those parts of my brains because with a lot of, a lot of mental exercise, you can access those parts of your brains yourself. 
but um, I couldn't as, as a 10 year old and I didn't know anything about what, you know, I knew nothing. So basically I was just clueless. Anyways, we went to go do those um, therapy sessions and I remember us getting there and it was a regular summer day, probably, you know, pretty hot outside and um, the drive wasn't really too far from where we lived. And um, so we got there and I don't know if I thought it was weird at the time, but I was just happy about the food because I don't know if your audience can see, but I'm not small. And um, <laughs> so the lady, um, the lady had made, and we're going to call her for the sake of privacy, Miss Janice. She had made like these little club sandwiches and they were tuna and egg salad and chicken salad and yum. They were so good. So I had had like maybe two or three of those little tiny miniature sandwiches and some iced tea. And um, it was good. I remember it being really good. And I was excited about the food. So I'm like, any therapy that comes with food is for me. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point we were doing, you know, we were we were, I, I felt like we were, I knew her, we were, had a cordial conversation, and I knew who, you know, I got to know her a little bit, and at this point, I was, you know, told, come on, follow me, come to my office, and so I went into her office with her, and she, in her office, um, it looked like just a regular office, like, if you can imagine any kind of therapy office, and it had a small couch um, where she said, you know, um, Andrea, make yourself comfortable. If you want to sit up, you're welcome to sit up. If you want to lay down, you can lay down. And I think at this point, I probably chose to lay down just because I was full from eating all them sandwiches. <laughs> so, so sleep sounded good to me. <laughs> so um, I laid down and then um, she started to um, do get into the therapy. So basically she started to explain to me what her next course of action was going to be and what she was going to explain to me and that I needed to be guided by the sound of her voice. And she was going to explain a um, scenario to me of where, you know, I was going to feel peaceful and tranquil and be in a very relaxed state of mind. And she did that. So basically, um, but before doing that, she said to me, you know, you're going to hear me snap my fingers like three times and call your name when I want you to come out of this. And you're going to be, you're going to hear me snap my th fingers three times. And then you're going to feel like you're not sleeping, but asleep. I, I don't know. So anyways, that happened. And she had um, described, I remember what I remember um, up until the point that I can't remember no more is that she described like a beach scenario to me like a, me being on a beach and you know feeling the sand between my fingers and my toes and feeling the heat of the day hitting my face and my shoulders and uh just you know hearing the waves and stuff like that and um you know voices in the distance of other people that were also on the beach and you know walking through the sand and stuff like that and I remember all of those things and then I remember and I, I I kind of froze right there in that beach setting standing yeah and I detached I disattached I dis like I disattached from my actual body mm -hmm. my body was there standing in the sand but I had like no emotion um I was kind of catatonic wasn't moving um, I had a blank stare on my face and I was witness to myself from another part somewhere else. I was like the air. I was just, at, you know, everywhere, but in, you know, seeing myself there. If that makes, yeah. I don't know if that makes much sense to people, but kind of like seeing an out-of-body experience would be the best way to, to describe this. So yeah. that's basically what it was. My body was there, but I was, my mind or my spirit was somewhere else there as well but not inside of my body mm -hmm. and um I remember while my body was just standing there and my spirit or my mind was somewhere else I remember seeing myself like I said in a catatonic state blank stare on my face um not moving just standing there and um no more memories after that mm -hmm. don't remember anything else after that then what see, I, I mean, for me, I guess it must have seemed like in my spirit and my mind over here where I was, that I was standing there like that for a really long time, but I wasn't concerned. Like, like 
I wasn't concerned about my body just standing there. Like I had no cares in the world. Like I could care less that I was just standing there. I was, you know, existing Mm -hmm. for lack of better words. But, um, so then I suddenly heard the Andrea and I was back. I, um, was, and when I say I was back, I mean, I was back in the therapy room. And so I sat up on the couch and I was, I felt like I was sweating profusely. Like I felt like I was having sweat run down my forehead and, um, all over me. And I felt like I had maybe just been through something. Like I had felt like I had just maybe ran somewhere or, you know, like been through something physical, but I really hadn't because I was just, you know, laying down. So I really hadn't gone anywhere, but except for that couch, but mentally I, I had gone somewhere. And so, um, so that happened and my session was over. She gave me some iced tea and told me you can meet with your aunt again before we bring your aunt in for her session. And so, okay, that's what I did. I, you know, hugged my aunt and my aunt at that point, you know, kind of wiped my forehead off and said, are you okay? She's like, do you think you need to wait, you know, outside of outside in the car do you want to are you okay still being in here do you want to wait in the waiting room for me to do my session and at this point I was okay with waiting you know Hmm. inside and just sitting and just relaxing um because that also meant that I could have more snacks and I like snacks so (laughs) so so that's what I did and my aunt was in there and I feel like she was in there for like an hour with her or something maybe maybe it was a little bit more I don't know and um doing her set her therapy session and then they both emerged out of the room and my aunt was like uh she came up to me and she you know had told me that her session was over um and then she had said you know we're about to do our session our reveal session together me and you um with miss janice and um but do you feel like you can do it she's like do you feel like you can go in there and have a grown-up mindset and 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 hear the things that she's gonna say. She says, because some of it may be scary and some of it might not even be things that you actually remember doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's all just it's like you're gonna go, we're, you're gonna go in here with me and you're gonna sit down and we're gonna hear a story that we told while we were sleeping that you know isn't true. It's just something we made up, basically. Mm-hmm. And did I want to do it? And I had a choice at that point that I could, you know, go, I could stay where I was and not join in or, you know, whatever. But like I said, back to the subject of being a 10 year old who loves to eavesdrop, you know, and, you know, if somebody's going to talk about me, I'm going to be there. I want to know what you're going to do, you know? So, and I felt confident at that point that I was okay enough to do, you know, like I wasn't going through any kind of crisis in my head at that point. I was like, okay, you know, yeah, I mean, whatever. So I went back in the room with my aunt and I didn't know, I feel, I feel like I didn't know that Miss Janice was recording us when she was recording us and the things that we were saying or the, you know, cause at the certain point where I told you that I was in a catatonic state and I was just standing on the beach. I guess that's where I have no memory of her asking the questions that she asks and the things that she does throughout the um, recording. But um, she starts to play back my recording first of the, uh, basically of what I said and what she asked. And it starts out just as it did when I went into my therapy session with being on the beach and you know, hearing voices and walking through the city, you know, all the things that you would attribute to being on a beach. Mm. And then all of a sudden it changes into and questions. And so the questions start from her. Um, and I don't, I can't be hugely accurate on what those questions really were. Um, but I know that I remember accurately my part of this, mm-hmm. the, the answers, um, because they were traumatizing, to say the least. Um, and I felt like I'm going to give, I'm going to insert like right here a warning for anybody who's listening. Um, the next things that I'm going to say are not easy to hear. 
And if you can imagine as a 10 year old child hearing them, it was very, very traumatizing to me. And I don't know who can really relate to the next things that I'm going to say, but this is the point where I get this off of my chest after 36 years. There's only been two people in my whole life that have heard this story. And now you guys. So um, just because of, like I said, there's going to be more encounters in the future, more interviews and more, you know, I'll be on here again and I'll be able to explain I'll explain myself more in detail and the things that are happening now because of this first experience. But um, for right now, there's a, in my life, there's there, I feel like there's a lot of people watching and maybe some retaliation. So I, I will only disclose this to you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that this is going to go all over the internet and anybody's going to be able to see it. And I'm okay with that um, because, you know, it's time. It's time for me to be able to get this off of my chest, regardless of whatever the outcome may be, regardless of whatever retaliation I fear or anything like that. Um, it's time for me to bring forth this story um, because I want to inspire other people that have been living in the shadows you know, to, so, so as to speak, to come forward and find people like you, Anthony, mm -hmm. that can help them get their stories out because it's very therapeutic to get it off of your chest after so long. And um, I know when I was talking with you personally before this, this show, um, when I was speaking with you personally, I know that there was a point where I was only able to tell you half of my story and then mm -hmm. I had to stop because of the emotions involved in it. And I feel like I'm, I'm to a point now where I am able to get through the whole story with you mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and the viewers, don't let me leave out your viewers um, and let you guys know this is what happened. And so with that said, and with the warning that I've given you, this is what happened next. Um, so I started to hear after the three clicks um, questions, and I distinctly remember myself describing my camping trip. And to be more specific, I was describing the night that I got up to go to the bathroom. Um, Saturday night, I'm not sure. I was mm -hmm. describing that night. And um, it went just as I mentioned before. I got up to go to the bathroom. Um, I remember now these are all the things that I, I, in my awake mind, remember until I didn't remember anymore when I had mentioned earlier, but so I remember getting up to go to the bathroom, fighting with the door, my aunt waking up and, uh, saying, what are you doing? Put a flashlight when you go, uh, et cetera. Um, but now, um, I woke up, fought with the door, had to go to the bathroom, but in this scenario, when I woke up this time, my aunt wasn't there. I wasn't told to put a flashlight. My aunt wasn't even there. I don't know where she was. And I wasn't concerned with where she was in, in, in the process of this questioning. I didn't look for her, didn't know where she was, just knew that I had to go to the bathroom. So I got out of the tent. And instead of going to the bathroom, I was met by two entities um it's difficult it's very difficult for me to remember this because mm -hmm. it's something that I actually lived through um but I was met by these two entities they look like children they look like children they look like me they were about as tall as me um they look like human children just like myself and um with the exception of they their eyes were different. They had very like, not the typical alien eyes you see, but more like of a, a larger almond eyes mm. and um, really long, skinny faces. Um, and I remember if I, if I can remember their, what they had on, it wasn't like clothes that I would wear. Like I wasn't, you know, they look like little divers. Mm. Um, like they, they look like they were, you know, 
diving because they had diving gear on is what I attributed it to be. But anyways, I was terrified. Um, I didn't know why they both grabbed my arms, what was happening and where they were taking me. Um, but I remember, um, them both grabbing my arms and then propelling me forward but I wasn't walking on my own feet. I was, I had my knees bent. Like, and if I'm going to describe this to you guys, it was like, I, I have been through the Catholic church and in the Catholic church, when you pray, you're required to be on your knees, um, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if you see that on your knees praying position, that's what it was, except for my hands were being held by these two entities. And I was on my knees, but being propelled forward. And I remember that that went on for, um, <clears throat> or I, I'm saying this, I, I'm not remember. I guess I'm, I'm telling Miss Janice this asleep or whatever, however, through the, through the regression, I'm telling her this, these things. And I remember being propelled forward for a little, for what seemed like, I guess, two or three minutes. I don't know, towards bright lights, helicopters, mm -hmm. bright lights, wasn't helicopters, um, but being propelled excuse me towards towards those lights and getting to um I want to say what looked like a wheelchair ramp um for a lack of a better description of what it was but um like a ramp that went upwards like wherever I was going was suspended from the ground yeah. but there was and but and like I said I was floating and I was being propelled like in a a, a I was neat. I was, my knees were bent under. So I was being, being propelled upwards. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> so we get to this ramp and I'm going up this ramp. And at the entrance of this ramp, we are met by two more children, humanoids, whatever they were. I don't know. There were two more of them. And at this point, the two that were holding my arms moved to the back of me and we're holding, one was holding each leg like this. And then the other two that were at the door grabbed my arms. And so the ones in the back had my legs, the ones in the front had my arms, and they were moving me inside of whatever this was, inside. And I remember there being like <coughs> really bright, <coughs> bright lights all around inside of here. Um, but just on the very like top, everything, it was kind of like, if you're looking half, half and half at something, like if you're looking at a, a glass of, let's say milk and the mm -hmm. milk is on top and the water is on the bottom, I guess, if, you know, I know my descriptions are not the greatest, but if you can imagine, and then on the bottom, it was like a darker, you know, it was dark, it was dark, it was like dim light, dark and on the top bright lights. So I'm moving through this sector and I see people and I don't mean aliens. I don't mean, you know, I mean, real people like me, you, anybody, real people. Um, and I'm freaking out at this point with these entities that are holding me. Um, I'm freaking out and I want my aunt and I don't know what, what they're doing or where they're taking me. And it's at this point that I'm hearing in my mind, calm down. We're taking you to your aunt. Don't worry. Um, but I'm not actually speaking. Nothing is coming out of my mouth and nothing's coming out of any of their mouths. I'm just hearing it here. And so um, I guess I don't know if that made me calmer or not. But anyways, like I said, I was being propelled forward and I saw the other human people in here. And I want to say two or three other human people that were like lined up and and there were a couple of them being held as well like they were not free to go they couldn't move about they were being held against their will as well as what I would call it now um mm -hmm. but anyway I was taken into I want to say an operating room because that's what it looked like to me as an adult I've had a lot of operations and I know I'm familiar with what an operating room looks like now um at the time I probably wouldn't have remembered that but what I told Miss Janice during this memory is that it looked like 
you know, just, I, I described basically the room. It was a room that had a metal table um, where I was taken and put on the metal table. Um, I was still being held down by all four entities. Um, they were holding my, my arms and my legs. Um, at this point, I had pretty much a little bit of a better look at them. I could make out um, their gender. I thought that they were um, two males and two females. Um, because they were so humanoid, they were, they looked like, they looked like they were human mixed with something else. And so, um, <clears throat> I knew I, just based on what you're taught, you know, as, you know, growing up, how to define male, female, you know, whatever, I knew that there were at least two males and two females mm -hmm. and they laid me on the metal table and they were holding me down. And I remember still crying and wondering where my aunt was. And at this time, my aunt came into the room. Now, if I were to describe um, the lighting of this room, I would say that up until this point, it was, you know, even when my aunt came in, it was very, very dim light. It was like walking through a room that was lit up by candlelight. And so at this point, my aunt came into the room and um, she kissed I think she kissed my forehead or something like that and then she grabbed my arm and when she grabbed my arm she injected me with something and I don't know what it was but um it was like a paralytic a paralytic agent like I couldn't move anymore after I was injected with it I couldn't move anymore and I remember her backing away and saying I'm sorry and mm -hmm. I didn't know what she meant by that. Or, you know, at the at that time, you know, I wasn't going into a lot of thought about what was really going on. I was just freaking out. And so um, she backed away. And as soon as she backed away and was out of my view, six beings came into this, the this operating theater room, whatever it was. And the lights got so bright that I couldn't see very good on, on the top like on the top what was it was like walking through the like walking and the sun is right on top of you that's what it was like and um they got very bright but I could see these six beings surround this metal table that I was laying on the four entities that were holding me were mo they moved away and these six beings were all around me and <coughs> these were aliens y'all um I mean Aliens, to say alien is so, so touche because you don't really, you know, everybody has their description of what alien is. And mm -hmm. to a lot of people who have been abducted, um, alien is, in, is different in many ways. Um, hence the reason it's called alien, which the definition is, you know, an unknown entity. Like, it's like, you know, you don't know what, what it is. It's mm -hmm. alien. To you. So these, to me, looked like they were all, I want to say, about five feet tall. Um, they all had, I think, like I said, it's too shade to say gray skin, but they had, you know, like, um, they were in like the space suit things, like not space suit, but, um, diving, diving suit things that the little, the little people were in the same, but, um, they were white and then, um, their heads were very long heads. Um, they had not almond eyes but big like big eyes mm -hmm. and not a typical no human nose that you would see but just like where a, where a nose would be the two holes mm -hmm. and then i want to say maybe a line for a mouth and that's the the only real memory i have detailed memory i have of those things um but then then they started to do things to me. So first, the first thing that they did was there was. Now, I know in our, our surgeries here on Earth, I'm going to say on Earth because I don't know where the hell I was, but our surgeries here, um, they do laparoscopic with mm -hmm. metal, you know, the metal things. Um, and they have instruments here where they do that they when they do the actual surgeries on us, 
that um they can burn flesh yeah you know to to carterize something and so um i noticed the very first thing that they did to me was they took one of those rods those metal rods that would be like what i said you know what i said about the how they do the surgery here but it was something like way more advanced i don't know but they took that and they inserted it in my right leg and i want to say about halfway down my leg um under like where my knee would be and <clears throat> i'm sorry i'm getting <laughs> feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now and it's just um a lot of that happens. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to get back on the topic of this, but I'm feeling a little bit of like, like surrounding, mm -hmm. like I'm being surrounded a little bit right now. Yeah. And although there's nobody here that I can see with my eyes, it's a little bit suffocating, but I'm going to, um, Okay, I'm gonna. Okay, so what I just what I did basically is kind of like a little mental exercise that I do when I need when I need things to go away, basically. Mm -hmm. And, and it kind of it worked a little bit so I feel a little bit better but um, so anyways, um, so the first thing that happened was that that where they stuck the rod in my leg. And then I think that they um, went up to where my left ovary is and they did the same thing with the rod there. They stuck the rod, not internally yet, or not, not internally, but where my left ovary, ovary was yeah. internally there and then pulled it out. And then I noticed that there was like smoke coming off the end of the rod. So I'm assuming that like it was carterized. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um. But then they, they did uh, after that an exam and um, to not be very graphic, it was a GYN exam. It was, um, it was basically them exploring my anatomy and it lasted probably, I don't know, maybe a couple minutes. Like I said, I had no concept of time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if time even existed during this, in this realm that I was in. But it seemed, I guess, like it was over relatively quickly. I don't know. And when everything, when those three things, four things were done, um, I was just laying there on the metal piece, very still, the metal slab, very still. And my aunt came back in the room again. And she picked me up. Like, you know, I don't know if you can can imagine an adult carrying a child um, in their arms. And I'm like, you know, my head's hanging off of her arms that my shoulders are like, and my body's across her. And then my legs are hanging off the other arm. So she picked me up like that and started to take me out of there and take me out of this thing, wherever I was mm -hmm. out of the room and then out of this, this thing that I was where I was at. And, um, I remember us going, me seeing that ramp again and her carrying me down that, like down that ramp, but she was, I want to say she was walking. So we must've been on the ground in this thing at this point. Mm -hmm. And, um, so she, cause she was walking down the ramp and I remember she got to the very end of it and, um, she, we both turned back and looked or something and at this point, I can recall better what it is I saw or where I was. And so it was um, like this, I want to say like this cigar, like you, you see the typical explanation of what a flying saucer is with the dome on top, the dome on the bottom, the yeah. lights all around. That, that's not, that doesn't describe this. This was more of like a cigar type of shape thing and it had um you know just the lights that you could see in the entrance and then maybe lights on top very bright lights on top and um that was my last 
that was my last memory that I was able to recall through regression before mm -hmm. being hearing the Andrea and being woken up. And so that was my recording with Miss Janice of what I remembered having happened during that time. And um, I just want to, you know, insert this here because I think it's imperative that the that the viewers understand, um, or not understand, let me rephrase that, that the viewers go back in my story and remember what I said um, my aunt's profession was. And if you think about what my aunt's profession was, she was a doctor. And so because she was a doctor, she was a very needed person. Um, not just in the ER where she worked in the hospital. I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about on an earthly realm. I'm talking about my aunt. I found out. Okay, so I guess, I guess, Anthony, this is the end of my, this story, the camping trip, you know, okay. this spring. But I wanted to insert the fact that my aunt was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And the last details of that, that she was a doctor, and she was a very needed person. Um, they used her, basically, a lot to calm down abductees, people mm -hmm. that they would abduct. And they used her skill, even though they're very advanced. Um, and they know way more than we on a human level know. Um, they mm -hmm. needed her for some reason. And I don't know if it was a calming reason or if it was, you know, what, what her exact position was with them. But she was used very much to yeah. serve their purpose. And because of her being used to serve their purpose, I was inducted into it as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, but like I had mentioned earlier, this has been happening to me since I was around three years old. There are other stories of, um, of when I was a very small child being pull pulled out of a window with my, with my older brother and that's, um, that's, that'll probably be my next story. Okay. But, um, so yeah, at this point now in my life as a 36 year old person, I've told you what my abilities are. Um, but I also, um, to this day continue to experience encounters, abductions. Um, I have been not interviewed, but followed by government. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that they know, I know that they know what's going on with me. Yeah. That there's, I know that they are, they have some kind of monitoring system mm -hmm. and that I am being monitored. And um, I know that that also sounds like it's probably this lady's delusional, mm -hmm. but I can assure you that I'm not. I can assure you that I have no mental health history. I don't have, I've never been diagnosed with any mental health issues, despite my history, despite my past. None of that has affected me as an adult. Um, so, but everything I'm telling you is accurate. And I, I'm very precautious in what I'm telling you. I'm sure in the future, more details will come out. Um, but right now, that's what, that's what I have for you you guys and I appreciate this opportunity um to tell you this story and get it off my chest and more than anything to I'm honored to be able to help other people that are going through the same thing because I know despite what anybody says there are other people that are going through this I saw them I saw them with my own eyes when I went on to that craft I saw other people human people just like me or you so I know that there's people going through this. It's not something everybody's making up. Yeah. And so I'm honored to be able to help other people like that come forward and get it out and tell what's going on. And also, you know, I know a lot of people are scared of 
retaliation from the government because the government has a big hand in this. Mm -hmm. But um, don't be scared. My advice, my advice to anybody who's listening to us right now or will listen to this is don't be afraid to tell your story. Get it out. The more people that get this out, that get what has happened to them in the open, it comes, it becomes like, you know, there's going to be so many people that are saying things now that they can't deny it anymore. They can't hide the truth from us anymore. You know what I'm saying? They can't, they can't hide the truth from people anymore. And once there is a bigger awareness of this, it might stop a little bit for people, you yeah. know? So that's my hope in the future. But yeah, that's the end of my story. And thank you for letting me tell it. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, you know, I got tons of questions. Okay. So I guess I'll start with that. Okay. Um, let's see. Did you, did your dad ever get back with your stepmom uh, after you moved in with your aunt? Yes, they did. Really? That's cool. Mm -hmm. They did. Um, do you think your aunt had a specific agenda with you? Yes. Yeah. 100%. Because as a later, um, let me, let me emphasize a little bit on that as a later, uh, later in my life as a, um, teenager and as a young adult, I was made a lot more aware of everything. Yeah. And I had many conversations with my aunt and I guess now is a good time, as good as a time of any, I was going to tell in the next, you know, session that you brought me on about my aunt, but my aunt has since passed away. Oh no. And yeah, so my aunt is no longer with us. She died around 2005. And even though she's gone, she's still here or there. But, um, and I'll explain that later, like I said, in another, another scenario, another, another story. Yeah. Okay. Um, that definitely shocked me because <laughs> I think that was one of my questions. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do you, do you think? You might have been abducted that first night when you heard something outside, uh, outside in the woods. Uh, I guess when your aunt shot. I think it's yeah. No, you heard no, something the, the first night. Not the first night. I think that the first night was an introduction to. Um, I think that the first night was leading up to to the abduction because mm -hmm. it was probably mentally getting me ready for the idea of something happening but it did not happen the first night. Do you think that your aunt talked to them when she was shooting off the pistol and then waited till you went back to sleep? You think she no, had no. like some kind of- No, my aunt had no interactions with them um, prior to me being abducted. And the reason that I say that is because later on through conversations, like I just mentioned um, with my aunt, she never knew when it was gonna happen. She never knew when they were gonna use her. Um, what do you think the dry blood on your knee was from? The rod that they inserted into my leg. And okay. then later on the tracking device. Okay. Um, do you also, do you think that you got abducted the night uh, when you, obviously you just mentioned that, going to the bathroom, um, mm -hmm. but you said you didn't remember at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think your aunt was well, that night? If you remember, Anthony, that night, remember I said that I saw helicopters, black helicopters yeah. hovering? And that all goes back to the same subject that I won't go into detail with about the government. Okay. Um, do you think your aunt was aware of what happened to you at that, like before you guys got the uh, um, past life regression, or I mean, uh, therapy? I think that she had an idea because. Yeah. She mentioned, um, at one point she mentioned, oh God, not this shit again. Yeah. And I think that she had an idea. Okay. Um, what city and state was this place again that you guys uh, camped at? Gulf coast of Florida. Oh no, the camping, the camping was in central Florida. Central Florida. And the park was called with Lacoochee state forest. Okay. Um, is this still, is still around or open? Yes, it's an active um, state park still. Okay. Now, how old was your aunt when you were 10? Do you know? When I was 10? Mm -hmm. In her 30s. In her 30s. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
do you know when she first experienced her um, encounters or dealings with them? I want to say childhood, but I don't know if I'm accurate on that. Okay. Uh, when because she always had a calling throughout her life to help people. And yeah. I mean that in her waking life, not in a sense of the way they used her. Yeah. Hence the reason why she probably became a doctor. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, how do you think when you when the park ranger came, how do you think those burns got on the ground that he mentioned? Birds are burns. Sorry. Burn, burns. They burn. Burns. That, yeah, the ranger mentioned. I know why. Mm -hmm. It's um they had visited that area, and when I say they, I mean the entities, extraterrestrials, had visited that area <coughs> prior to our abduction. All right. Um, and he also meant it, uh, mentioned the uh, gutted animals. What do you think that was from? Experiments. Experiments? I figured since you were in a wooded area, wasn't you? Like backwoods? Yeah. Deep woods. Uh, Deep woods. I, I, I seem to think a lot of times that there's other creatures and cryptids and stuff out there, like Bigfoot and Dogman and stuff like that. That. that and any practicing. one of those things may have been a possibility. Um, but I can assure you, during this course of time, they yeah. were not, okay. because there was something bigger and badder around. Um, why? Why do you think your aunt wanted to stay in the mounds, even though I know it was dark and stuff, but? Say, like, she could ask the park ranger. The burial ground, you said, or the camp? Uh, I guess where you guys were at the burial grounds where you camped out, right? No. Well, no, the burial ground was a, a, just an activity that we did. But I understand what you're asking. Why okay. do I think that my aunt wanted to stay camping Sunday yeah. night? Um, Sunday night, right? Yeah. Um, at, the time, at the time, I thought it was just because she didn't want to drive out of there, you know, during the dark. Yeah. But now that I reflect on that, um, she was in her 30s, so she was young. Her vision was good. You know, there would have been no reason why she couldn't have driven us out of there and, and you know, adhered to the ordinance of the park being closed. But she was just insistent on the fact that she wanted us to stay that night. Okay. Um, when, when do you think her watch broke? Because it, it was... You know, if it was that night, how did it end up on 11 a.m.? I honestly don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, because I was like, man, if she would have noticed it the day prior, if it would have broke, because she says she uses it for everything. And for it to be cracked at, at 11 a.m. At, at the strangest number, it's like, if that was meant to yeah, happen... Anthony. I want to mention something now that you're asking about that watch and that specific time, mm -hmm. because although 11 a.m. does not make sense to maybe you or your viewers, it makes absolute sense to me. Okay. 11 a.m. is something that I see on a regular basis. Okay. 11, 11, 11 a.m., 101. I see all this on a regular basis, yeah. and usually it is an indication of an upcoming abduction for me. Oh, wow pretty incredible uh, and you say that you still have abductions up until now i do my most recent one which i will not go into a lot of detail about but i will tell you um was before i moved to where i'm at now and i was being pulled out of my bedroom window i had to be scary i was being levitated off of my bed and pulled out of my bedroom window as my husband slept next to me has he ever awoke to that or yes. uh, been terrified? Yes. Yeah. He's awoke to it, but it stops when he awake, when he's woken up. How does he how does he feel about this happening to you all the time? My husband has always been a skeptic. Okay. Um, I feel like he um supports my stories. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much he believes of them. I feel like regardless, he supports me. Okay. All right. Um, do you know if Miss Janice is still alive? And if so, um, do you think she still has that video evidence? Of I have no idea. Miss um, Janice is just um, 
a name that I gave to protect her privacy, but I have no idea of anything about her where, where she is in Florida, um, if she still practices hypnotic regression. At the time, she was in her 60s. I'm 36 now, and I was 10, so I don't know. Um, I do have, I want to say I have one or two pictures, or maybe, maybe, maybe even three pictures of that camping trip. Yeah, that I'd love at a later date to post. Um, one of them, when I was fishing, and you know, so I have some pictures just to give the audience an idea of what it looked like there. Yeah, but um, as far as Miss Janice goes, I don't have any information on her, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I think I only have one more question. Was something else pops up? Okay. Um, do you think your aunt remembered uh, being in the UFO when she was coming out, and then when she woke, when you guys woke up? she was being like mean to you about like you getting mud in the tent okay so i think my aunt subconsciously knew what happened yes mm -hmm. and i think the result of that was her consciously uh, um getting on to me the next day and it was it was a cover-up basically to make me think that i had went out and got ten all dirt all over the tent, yeah. and um, you know, then she because because she had the very specific question of Andrea, do you remember what you did last night? Yeah, and so I will never forget that question because, and it still resonates in my mind to this day as I think about the whole series of events. Yeah. Her very specific question to me the next morning, Andrea, do you remember what you did last night? I didn't. I did not remember. What was her last words to you before she passed away? <clears throat> well, it's kind of incredible because my aunt committed suicide. <laughs> my aunt, um, I used to speak with her every week before she died. And um, now this is, this is very, very hard for me, Anthony. This is a subject that will make me cry because my aunt meant the world to me yeah. um i used to speak with her every week um before she passed away and um without fail we had phone conversations mm -hmm. every week even into adulthood before she passed away and um there was nothing leading up to me even knowing that this was going to happen um except for i knew that she had a lot of medical problems she had um previously in her um in her career uh attracted or contracted excuse me i don't know um hepatitis b from injecting a patient that had it and then subsequently accidentally injecting herself okay. and so um i knew that she was suffering a lot physically and um but i didn't know the extent of it because at that point, I was an adult and I didn't live with her anymore. But the last thing I remember, the last conversation I remember having with her before finding out about her passing on the day that she passed was her and her husband, because she was newly married for the second or third time, newly married, and her and her husband were going to go close on a house that day. They were set um they they had plans to go and sign the paperwork to close on a house and that they were going to both be buying and um from the way that it was told to me they did that then they came home and billy was his name went to her husband went to the store the grocery store and the pharmacy to pick up other medications mm -hmm. and um this was an assisted suicide um, nobody was there, but Billy knew about this and assisted in it. Um, he put the medication within reach of my aunt so that she would have access to it. Yeah. And, um, per her request and, um, went on to the store. And during the time that he was at the store, she did what she had to do and was, and, and, um, was gone after that and do i think that her physical ailments were enough to have made her do this absolutely not do i believe that what she was going through with the government and being used was mm -hmm. absolutely 
she wanted it to end. She, there was towards the very end of her life, we could talk like I'm talking with you right now about these abductions and everything that was happening. Um, and she was telling me that she was being visited on a regular basis, that they were coming in on a regular basis and surrounding her bed and paralyzing her. And she just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. She just did not want to have to do it anymore, be used anymore, because it was taking such a toll on her to have to do whatever it was that they wanted her to do to all these people that they were taking. Wow. Well, um, I, I appreciate you for coming on and, you know, telling your story. And I know that we're going to be having you back on for a few other episodes because you have plenty of stories. And <laughs> if, that, if I didn't have to go to work right now, then we'd be having you do another one. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got to say, you seem like um, I had a really, like I said, a beautiful relationship with my aunt and she's somebody that I could talk to for hours. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like I said, in the very beginning, Anthony, I'm very much able to read people, mm -hmm. their personalities. And I found out, well, I, I, I found out when I first met you before even knowing who you were, mm -hmm. that you were somebody that is very much like my aunt. And I can, somebody I can probably talk to a very long time in, in detail and mm -hmm. not be judged. Yeah, no, so, I definitely, I appreciate you. I, yeah, I don't want to judge nobody. I, when I created this uh, show and channel, I just want people to come on and tell their stories. And, you know, obviously they're not going to tell other people. And, you know, there, there's something bigger at hand. And I feel like if everybody was just to put in their stories, we can actually connect the dots and see the bigger picture. Anthony, when you say that there's something bigger at hand, I know that you don't emphasize on that, but I know that you have an idea of how big. I know that you understand that it's a lot more than what is able to even be explained. Yeah, yeah most so. definitely. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like I said, I, I appreciate you coming on and and telling your story and you were very detailed so that that's amazing at hand. great well my <laughs> goal was to be candid as possible and honest as possible and um i know uh there's going to be people doubters out there that are not going to believe this and i'm okay with that and um my goal it also was to attract an audience that has had similar things happen to them and you know, have them be able to reach out to you or anybody that they can and tell their stories as well. And that was my, that was my goal in this. And so I'm glad that I was given an opportunity. Thank you. Um, if anybody wants to reach you or has questions for you, uh, how can they get a hold of you? So um, let me see, what is the best way? So I, I, I don't want to inundate you with direct messages through you people that want to Okay, well, anybody who wants to ask me any questions direct, can directly message you if that's okay. And I'm willing to answer anything that they that they ask. Or um, if, if, if this is seen by maybe bigger people who have television abilities or something like that, you know, um, yeah. at that point, I would say that I would let you advocate for my story and decide how you best want to move forward with telling it. Okay. Well, okay. Before we close the show, is there any closing comments or advice you'd like to give uh, the viewers for your experiences? So like I said earlier, um, my biggest advice to anybody watching this is, guys, don't be afraid. Come forward. Um, I mean, I know that's, that's hard for me to say because I was afraid to come forward, but I'm honestly not now. I feel like I've got, I feel like a lot of weight has just been lifted off of my chest. And I want that same thing for everybody else. I want you guys to come forward. I want you to get in touch with Anthony or whoever it is that's around you and get your story out. And if you don't feel comfortable coming on video and doing it, then, you know, call him and let him record your story. Or, you know, if you can't do either one of those, at least write it down. Because if you write it down, then you're not the one, you know, you are telling your story, but you're not the one actually vocally telling it and you can just hand it to you know somebody who can tell it so you can get it off your chest and don't keep it you know don't keep it bottled up because that's what they want us to do mm -hmm. i agree well 
thank you again, Andrea, for coming on. And thank you guys for watching. And I just want to say that's been another episode of Real Supernatural Encounters. And I hope you guys have a great evening. We'll see you later. Thank you. Bye, everybody.